morning, everyone. Thanks, Pilendium, for this opportunity. Uh, let's get started. Some cheap marketing. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders, directors of uh, Centropy Technologies. We do end-to-end -end, uh, implementations of fintech and data science projects. Before that, I was working with the hedge fund for almost 10 years. And uh, I'm part of the organizing committee of uh, PyCon India 2018. Most of this works in Python 3 and later. Uh, uh, I haven't really tested everything with Python 2, but most of it should work. Okay, there we go. Let's get started. What are classes in Python? So the way I'm going to run this is I'm going to keep switching between my presentation and this notebook. And like, you know, I'm going to do some, uh, um, you know, stuff here and then go back to the slides and like I'm going to link both the things. That's how I'm going to run this uh, entire thing. So uh, before we talk about classes, I'll just get into some practical stuff. Let me create a simple class. I call it class test. No, nothing there, nothing fancy there, a very simple thing. I create an instance of the class, all good. I'm checking the type of the class. It says uh, the class that I just created, test. And then uh, I'm checking the type of the class itself, which is test. It says type, good. And then like I also check the type of the type itself, which again says uh, type. So everything boils down to type. So practically speaking, classes in Python are like, you know, they are first class supported entities. Technically, classes is an, class is an instance of type. And like, you know, uh, the classes are themselves like, you know, sugar in Python, like, you know, where we use class to create an instance of uh, type. Okay, then what is type in Python? So let me look at the official doc of it. For convenience, I have it here. All that it says is, uh, you know, there is a signature which says I can use it in two ways. I can try by supplying this an object, or I can pass three arguments to it, which is name, basis, and dict. The first usage of it gives the object's type. The second one helps me to create a type, which internally is a class. So I have this name, basis, and uh, dict. So name is the name of the class that I used to create it. Basis is the list of all the base classes that I want to inherit for this particular class. The dict is a dictionary of the attributes and their values that I want to be available for me for my usage within the class. A quick example there, like I'm just creating a simple class uh, using the same invocation. I'm just calling type. The first one is a name followed by the object, which is a base class. I'm just creating it an empty dictionary. Like let me look at the type of it. It says type. And then like I'm creating an instance of what I just created. And then when I create the, when I check the type of it, it says it is a class. So all that I've achieved is I've created a class without using the class as a instance of the core type. So this is how I dynamically create a class and also create an instance of it. So this is what I get by type. So type essentially is an important data structure. Like, you know, uh, it's a native structure that is used for creating classes. Now, let me get into some life cycle uh, of, uh, that is involved in creating a class. If you look at it, this is a very vanilla example. All that I do here is I create a test class. I have all the magic methods, which is the dunder new, dunder call, and dunder in it. All that I'm doing is I'm just simply like, you know, uh, putting up a print statement there and like, you know, calling the super method. Nothing fancy here. So this is just there to illustrate how when each methods are called whenever I create something in Python. So all that I'm doing is the class is created, nothing got printed, so nothing really got executed in this piece of code. I'm creating an instance of the class, so that calls the new method and the init method. So technically, this is the life cycle. When I request for an instance, the dunda new method gets called, then the dunda init method gets called, then the instance is returned. Technically, this is the dunder new and the dunder init combination is a constructor in other object-oriented languages like Java and like C sharp. Uh, there is a convenience in Python where we, have, where we have two methods. One is responsible for the instance creation. The other one is responsible for initialization of attributes within the instance. Uh, I'm just doing a simple call here. All that I'm doing is I'm supplying a bunch of attributes to the instance. So this internally calls the call method. I'm executing it for more than one time, second time, third time. Internally registering the call count, I get the uh, call count as three. So the important takeaway, we know what the life cycle of it is. And like, you know, we also know like call method is, uh, or 
class instances are callable, wherein like I can supply a bunch of parameters and I can get some attributes out of it. Let me do a quick recap. All that I did so far is, class is an instance of type. The type is the holy grail that we spoke about. This is the base of everything that we do in Python. And uh, more importantly, like uh, if you clearly notice, I'm stressing it over and over again, like you know, type is the holy grail and like class is an instance. You can further have objects which are instances of the class that is created. Type can be used to create dynamic classes. And like you know, we also saw about the life cycle. Now, this is good. Now we have the type. What can I really do with this type? So like, you know, um, basically like, you know, type is one thing which can be, which is used to create a class. So technically by modifying something in type, I'll be able to change the behavior of the classes. Given that type is native, we can't go and change it directly. However, we can subclass type and do something there. So that is what we call meta classes. So meta class is nothing but, it is a subtype of type. It helps in changing the way the class behaves. Commonly called as black magic, somebody said somewhere, and like you know, it is used to uh, actually like use it only when you actually need it. So, a lot of things have been spoken. I'll just do a simple meta class before we get on to the next steps. So, like all that I'm doing here is it is a simple meta class where I try to create a singleton pattern. So internally, I'm writing a meta class uh, and then like uh, you know using that in a meta class. I'll also introduce to the syntax of it. So this is the syntax of creating a meta class, which is like I create a meta class. All that I need to do is it needs to be a child of it needs to be a child of type, and then using the meta class, this is the Python three syntax wherein like you know I supply a meta class uh, uh, keyword argument and supply the meta class that I just created. Let me do a simple meta class now. So. The, uh, the stuff is simple. All that I do is I create it as a subtype of, uh, a subclass of type, and then I override the dunder call method. Internally, I maintain a dictionary. Whenever I ask to create an instance of a class, I just check whether it is available in the dictionary. If available, return it from the dictionary. If not, then I like, create a new one and then put it into the dictionary and return the same stuff. Simple stuff. And like, you know, now I try and use this meta class in the class that I just created. So, by um, uh, so this needs to uh, behave like a singleton, wherein like if I ask for multiple times the instance of the class, it needs to return me the same instance. So I'm creating two instances of it. Let me check the type and IDs of it. You look at it; the IDs are the same, which means it is returning me the same class over and over again. Let me also introduce you to the big picture of it. So from a big picture, we have the type and Class is an instance of a type. We already established that. Then we can create objects which are instances of the class. Then what we can also have is a meta class, which is a child of a type. And we can use the meta class that we created to create new classes. And that can be used to create change the behavior of both the class and the instances of the class. Let me quickly go into the life cycle of the meta classes. So uh, we have spoken a lot. I'm just uh, putting in uh, you know, a simple stuff about uh, a simple meta class. Same stuff as I did earlier. All that I'm doing is I'm overriding a bunch of methods, adding some print statements there, and I'm like, you know, calling the super method of it. So I have dunder new, dunder call, and dunder in it. And like, you know, I created my meta class. Nothing got printed, so like the meta class is clean. Now what I do is I use this meta class in one of my classes, and now I kind of create a class. When I do this, I can clearly see it calls the meta classes new method and the init method. So we saw earlier in the life cycle, like you know, whenever I create an instance of a class, it calls the new method and the init method. So type, so class being a instance of type, it gives me the uh, it calls the meta classes new method and the init method. Now let me try and call the then let me try and create an instance of the class. So all that I, all the things that get called is I get the meta classes call method gets called, followed by the instances new on the init method. I think pictorially representing this. So we have the meta class. In the meta class, you have the new init and the call methods. In the actual class, you have like you know again the new init and the call methods. Whenever the actual class is created. The red ones get called, which is the meta classes new and init method gets called. 
And when I create an instance of a class, the meta classes call method gets called, and the actual classes new and init method gets called. I think this is the crux of what we uh, will do primarily with meta classes. So broad idea, if you really look at it, if you want to change something in the actual class, you need to change it in the meta classes new and init method. If you want to change something, the behavior of a classes instance, then you need to deal with the call method of uh, the meta class. So this is what is the broad idea. Like you change the behavior of a class itself. You use the dunder new and dunder init methods. You change the behavior of the instance of a class. You use the dunder call method. Okay. So this is all the theory part of it. This is required uh, to uh, follow what we will be doing further. So I'm going to get into some of the patterns that we will use meta classes and like you know we'll see some usages of like you know all the stuff that we saw so far. The first pattern I'll like to go into is uh, the abstract classes. So what we really do here is like uh, you know we use one of the native meta classes that is available, which is called ABC meta. So there is a uh, built-in package called ABC, like you know from which I am getting the ABC meta and the abstract method. Let me see the doc of ABC meta. So all that it says is it is a meta class for defining abstract base classes. Usage very similar to what we have done so far. I create a class which is my abstract class, and like uh, you know, I have the meta class defined to it, which is the ABC meta, and then init method is just a dummy there. And like you know, you have I have also defined an abstract method, used the at abstract method decorator there to decorate it and call it as an abstract method. So what this does is it says this is an abstract class, and there is an abstract method that is available. And by uh, definition of that, I cannot directly create an instance of this uh, uh, class. I can only subclass it and implement the abstract method. Only then will it allow me to create an instance. Let me try and create the abstract class instance. It doesn't work. Now I'm creating a subclass of it. For illustration purposes, let me actually comment out uh, the child classes abstract method definition. Now when I create it, it again says, uh, cannot instantiate because the my abstract method is not initialized. Now let me go back. Let me remove the comment. I'm able to create it. So like you know, this is one fundamental uh, design pattern where you could create abstract base classes and like you know, you could use them to kind of uh, like you know uh, create your uh, abstract method definitions and whatnot. The next pattern we'll be looking at is like you know, abstract family of singleton classes. So uh, there is a, um, so I used to be a, a Perl programmer, then I became a Java programmer, and then like, you know, for the past four years I've been coding in Python. The day I came to Python, one of my fundamental questions are, where is my interface, where is my abstract class, like, you know, how do I do those things? So uh, this is how uh, uh, we figured out probably we could do an interface, which is like, you know, uh, all we wanted to do was we need to have an abstract base class or an interface. I'm talking about the requirement here. And you have multiple implementations of this, and you want each one of them to be singleton. We have seen abstract base classes separately. We have seen singleton separately. Uh, one problem with meta classes is you can only give one single meta class as a meta class to a given class. You cannot have more than one. To get around that thing, what we can do is we can combine two meta classes. All that I'm doing is I have a singleton ABC meta, which I inherit from ABC meta. If you look at it, internally ABC meta inherits from type. So I'm, uh, I need to override the behavior of the singleton. So basically, like you know, uh, the, the subclass should be a singleton, which means it deals with the classes instance. So I override the dunder call method. And then like when I do that, I kind of do the same code that I did with the singleton. I have a local dictionary which I maintain to uh, hold the classes. And like whenever I call for instance, I check the dictionary if available return there or else like you know, created and written there. So create this. Now I have a, I know, uh, my abstract singleton class, which uses this meta class to create the top one, which is the ABC or the interface. This is done. Now when I create, try and create an instance of it, it fails and says like, you know, it is, uh, doesn't implement the abstract class. Now I have a singleton child of it, which is like implementing the abstract meta class, also implementing the abstract method. So now let me create two instances of it. Let me uh, check the types. I see like you know the types are matching and also the IDs are matching, which means it is returning me the same instance. 
So like here we are dealing with two things, which is like, you know, abstractness and also singleton. So this is like chaining of meta classes that we can really achieve by, you know, if there are more behaviors to be required. We need to be a little careful about how we chain it and like, you know, uh, we, we can get that done. The third pattern that I'll talk is about uh, hashable objects. So uh, like, you know, uh, when I talk about the hashable objects, like, uh, you know, uh, we all know like uh, not anything and everything could be hashed in uh, Python. So like, you know, uh, the key of a hash, uh, the key that we put in a dictionary should be immutable. So this is a simple pattern which says like, uh, you know, uh, which says like, you know, it gives you an ability to put any object into the dictionary. So practically speaking, all that uh, we are now doing here is we are defining abstract method called get key, which uh, is abstract in nature. And like, you know, anybody who uh, kind of um, uh, uses this as a parent class will implement this. And like we are overriding the equals method, which will uh, use the get key method. So technically I can use this and like, uh, you know, create my hashable class. Like uh, moment I do this, I can get my hashable object. So basically like, you know, the keys that I'm using here are just the attributes A and B. So this gives me an ability to, uh, you know, reuse the hashableness here where there is A1 and A2. And like, uh, you know, if you uh, look at it, I'm just comparing A and B, which are the first two values. So the first two ones are not equal. The second and third one are like equal. Now I try and put it in a hash map. This works. I'm skipping the comparable ones. I'll get into the pooled objects. So the pooled objects is just an extension of the singleton that we saw. So if you really uh, look at it, the definition is the same. So the requirement here is whenever I supply the same set of arguments for creating an instance of the class, I need to get the same object. I don't want to get, uh, I know, multiple variations of it. So all I do here is like I internally create a tuple, which is a thing of uh, args and uh, CLS. This doesn't work every time because like your args could be heterogeneous. So like you need to take care of like, you know, what it is. Uh, advice that I will say is probably you change the args to the actual arguments that you need in your uh, class. Like you create your bean meta. Now you have your bean class, which is using this thing. Now I'm creating four instances of it by supplying four arguments. If you look at the IDs, the first and the fourth one are the same, which means like, you know, they are using the same class. So like this is uh, some kind of a pooled objects wherein like, you know, you can, it gives me the same instance where as far as I support the, I supply the same arguments. Other ways of doing this are like, you know, you could use an object pool manager or you can use a, um, you know, you can also use a, um, a moist uh, function which could uh, actually help in getting the same stuff. The last pattern that I'll get today is with uh, sealed classes. So in sealed classes, uh, the requirement is like, you know, I just want to know more subclasses of this particular class and uh, the subclassing should end with, uh, so I don't want anybody else overriding or like subclassing this and like, you know, overriding behavior. I need this to be the bottom of the tree. So, uh, Implementation is again like you know I uh, I get the um, you know the basis for each of the bases I get what is the meta class of that particular place which I get by calling the type and when I do this I get all the meta classes that is used in the entire chain of MRO now I can check whether my sealed meta is available in the meta classes if it is available then like you know somebody is uh, you know kind of using this class as a parent and then I raise error so. This is what it is. I create my sealed class, like supplying this as a meta class, all good. Now, when I try to override, uh, you know, my uh, uh, override the sealed class and create a child of it, it says an error saying that, you know, you can't instantiate a sealed class. So uh, basically, like, you know, there are more behaviors that we can actually, um, you know, do this. Uh, We're running out of time, otherwise I would want to show this one thing, which is like, you know, logging using meta classes. So technically what I'm trying to do here is like, uh, you know, uh, we kind of uh, use the meta class to log every function that is called. We can use it again with the call method, like, you know, uh, uh, we can use it again with the Dunder new method, apply a decorator to each one of them and we can get it done. And more things can be done in meta classes, like, you know, thank this opportunity to giving me this opportunity to present this thing. I think uh, there are some references, like, you know, there is one video meta programming by David Weasley, wonderful thing. Um, uh, I think it's a three hour long video. Everybody should see that it's like, you know, quite uh, uh, in which, um, enlightening when it comes to meta classes. Obviously practical, um, uh, you know, stack overflow gives a lot of supports. Ready to take any questions if you have any.
Thank you. So he's so kind and he's going to ask a couple of questions. Yeah, over there. Um, nice talk, by the way. Thank you. Um, with the keys and hashable objects, you said something about putting the objects in hash maps, but you actually never showed what happens if they had equal keys. Right. So uh, uh, Python mandates that you you need to have the keys of any uh, uh, dictionary to be immutable, because like if it is mutable, the hash code is computed once. It, it is the same in every other language, because like if the uh, if if, it, if the object is mutable, then like the hash code changes. You recompute the hash. It is not possible. So the only way you could do is like you know keeping the object itself immutable. What I've tried and done there is like you know saying, this is what uh, my uh, keys are. And like you know, use that to actually uh, hash it into the thing. I'll probably share this notebook. You can take a look at it and see. Thank you. Does it? Uh, um, thanks for the talk. Uh, Thank you. It's called practical patterns, and right. I look at some of them, and I think they are very illuminating how the language works. But uh, when I look at something like a sealed class, uh, I think like, would I ever use it in an application? Would I ever be so, so not trusting of my fellow developers that I would say, look, this is a sealed class, don't touch it. Um, <laughs> so, so would you? Do you have a motivating example for that, or, or so, where uh, would you actually do that? Basically, like you know, seal the classes. Like you know, I thought it will be easier to uh, illustrate here, but a more practical usage, which could be used as an extension of the seal class that you saw here, is you sometimes don't want to allow your clients to overwrite some methods. So basically, what you can essentially do is instead of not stopping them totally from, you know, uh, using this as a parent class. There are many instances where you don't want somebody to overwrite the methods. You could use this idea. This is just an idea. You could use this idea, extend it a little more to achieve that, which has far more practical usages than the sealed class itself. So one more question. Yeah. I was gonna, just going to ask, because you came from Java to Python, would you ever go back now or now? No, I came, from, <laughs> I came from Perl to Java to Python. <laughs> so like, you know, I definitely missed Perl when I was in Java. And like, you know, I found the answer with Python. I found peace with Python. I'll stay with Python. <laughs> OK. So one last thing, like, you know, I'll just uh, do this. I'm also a co-organizer of PyCon India. PyCon India is happening uh, from October 5th through 9th in Hyderabad, India. This is the 10th anniversary of Python India, and like you know, the CFP is open, the tickets are open. Like uh, these are the keynote speakers we have for the event, and like you can find more details at in.python.org. And hope to see many of you there. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much.